Hello everyone. I am Dr. Zarr. Today, February 1st, is the anniversary of the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. In memory of this tragic event, this video presents a compilation in chronological order of our past videos concerning the Space Shuttle program in the hopes that you can learn about the disaster in the broader context of the Space Shuttle program's history. Our first video in this compilation concerns how the origins of the program were among the accomplishments of one of the United States' most controversial presidents. On January 5, 1972, President Richard M. Nixon announced the Space Shuttle Program, an American space exploration system that would go on to make 135 trips to space over three decades, carrying astronauts from 16 different countries. Today we list a few of Nixon's accomplishments often overlooked by his Watergate complicity. He was president during the first moon landing in 1969. He decreased Cold War tension with the USSR, known as detente, in 1969. He worked to racially desegregate the U.S. from 1969 to 1974. He established the EPA and other environmental initiatives in 1970. He established OSHA in 1970. He ended large-scale U.S. participation in the Vietnam War in 1972. He initiated normal relations with China in 1972, and he endorsed the Equal Rights Amendment in 1972. Our second video in this compilation discusses the flights of the Challenger prior to its destruction. On October 30, 1985, the American Space Shuttle Challenger lifted off on its ninth mission, a successful flight that lasted over seven days and was notable for having taken the first Dutch astronaut into space. Challenger had a successful career from its first flight into space in April of 1983 through its ninth flight in October and November of 1985, spending nearly 1,500 hours in space flight. Unfortunately, as we have chronicled, on January 28, 1986, the magnificent space machine blew up and went to pieces only 73 seconds into its tenth and final flight, costing the lives of all seven astronauts aboard. One of six space shuttle reusable spacecrafts, Challenger was not the only shuttle to meet with disaster, as Columbia burned up upon re-entry to Earth's atmosphere in February of 2003, also killing the seven astronauts aboard. Our third video in this compilation details the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. On January 28, 1986, the U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger took off right on schedule, only to explode 74 seconds later, killing all seven crew members on board in front of a horrified live television audience. Digging deeper, we find Challenger having made nine previous successful flights and having traveled over 25 million miles in its career prior to the tragedy. The crew, who had planned to study Halley's Comet as part of their mission, also included a civilian, Mrs. Sharon Krista McAuliffe. Mrs. McAuliffe, who was from New Hampshire, had won a contest to become the first ordinary citizen in space. The high school teacher became an instant celebrity as news of her participation spread all over the world. She even intended to give a few science lessons from space. The Challenger, on its 10th mission, lifted off at about 11 in the morning, traveling at about twice the speed of sound. Less than two minutes into its flight, an O-ring on one of the main rocket engines failed, causing fuel to leak, which then led to a fire and then to the explosion. The weather in Florida had been unusually cold, and engineers recommended the flight be postponed. But impatient officials of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, insisted on launching anyway, and the cold is believed to have been the cause for the O-ring failure. Unfortunately, all seven crew members died in the explosion and crash. It was initially reported that the crew was killed immediately in the enormous explosion, but later it was determined that the cabin of the shuttle did not explode, but instead detached from the rest of the orbiter, and it was surmised that the crew probably died upon impact with the Atlantic Ocean. 
America was devastated by the first fatal in-flight space accident, especially the many school-aged children who were following the takeoff on TV to see the Challenger carry a teacher, McAuliffe, into space. President Ronald Reagan announced a week of mourning as a sign of respect for the crew who lost their lives for the country. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd plan to speak to you tonight to report on the State of the Union. But the events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers, but overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes, Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista Mikolov. We mourn their loss as a nation together. To the families of the seven, we cannot bear, as you do, the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace that special spirit that says, give me a challenge and I'll meet it with joy. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve and they did. They served all of us. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. We've grown used to the idea of space and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, the members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. And I want to say something to the school children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. I've always had great faith in and respect for our space program, and what happened today does nothing to diminish it. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. We'll continue our quest in space, there will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. I want to add that I wish I could talk to every man and woman who works for NASA or who worked on this mission and tell them your dedication and professionalism have moved and impressed us for decades, and we know of your anguish. We share it. There's a coincidence today. On this day, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake died aboard ship off the coast of Panama. In his lifetime, the great frontiers were the oceans, and a historian later said he lived by the sea, died on it, and was buried in it. Well, today, we can say of the Challenger crew, their dedication was, like Drake's, complete. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. NASA also postponed further Space Shuttle flights indefinitely. Investigations into the disaster produce conflicting results. Investigators also reveal that the engineers of the booster rockets had advised against launching the shuttle that morning, as the below freezing temperatures at Cape Canaveral were likely to damage the rockets.
This disaster caused an interruption in space shuttle flights of over two years while NASA studied the accident and took measures to ensure there would not be another O-ring failure. Unfortunately, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated on re-entry in 2003 as a result of having lost heat protective tiles at takeoff. That might be uh, some plasma now. Think so, Eddie? Uh, the astronaut firing right now. Uh, it was quite a bit, actually. Yeah, we see it out the front also. There's some plasma. Some of them, there's good stuff out front. I'm filming overhead right now. That's uh, kind of dull. Uh, it will be obvious when the time comes. Well, really, I guess I could give you the camera to put out the front window. Here, let's, uh, no, let's don't do that. Okay. Let's okay. just, uh, just go ahead and make sure you check your suit pressure integrity, too. All right. Check on it at come with the uh, visors down. CDR. DLT. Yes, one. MS one. I don't have my gloves on, yes. So oh, MS uh, All right, good enough. So we're going to leave visors down now. Oh, no, oh, I'm no, just no, saying, no. just check your seat. That's okay, and sure. then I'm going to go back off. Yeah. Yeah. Oddly enough, Space Shuttle Challenger was named after a British ship, a corvette that led a scientific mission from 1872 to 1876 to study marine topics. It was called the Challenger Expedition. All remaining space shuttles are retired now, and NASA is currently without a manned spacecraft. As a question for my students, do you have any desire to travel in a spacecraft? If so, to where? If you like this video and would like to receive notification of new videos, please feel welcome to subscribe to History and Headlines. Your viewership is much appreciated.
our fourth video in this compilation, focuses on the first neurologist in space. On January 22, 1992, NASA launched mission STS-42, the Space Shuttle Discovery, into space with a crew that included Ukrainian-Canadian Dr. Roberta Bondar, a neurologist. The first Canadian woman and the first neurologist to become an astronaut, Bondar is a woman of many accomplishments and is yet another example of Canadians of Ukrainian descent such as Alex Trebek and Wayne Gretzky to achieve great things. A highly accomplished scholar, Bondar was educated at the University of Guelph, BSc, the University of Western Ontario, MSc, the University of Toronto, PhD, and McMaster University, MD. Bondar's scientific drive and sense of adventure led her to become one of the first six people in the Canadian Astronaut Corps in 1983. Who is your favorite astronaut? Our fifth video in this compilation is about multiple space exploration failures. On September 25, 1992, NASA launched a probe known as the Mars Observer alternately known as Mars Geoscience Climatology Orbiter, an unmanned spacecraft sent to study the surface, atmosphere, climate, and magnetic field on Mars. Unfortunately, in August of 1993, communication with the Mars Observer was lost permanently, a costly failure. Today we list several egregious space exploration failures and invite you to tell us which one you think was the worst. Apollo 1 Fire on Ground, 1967, three astronauts died. Soyuz 11 Docking Decompression, 1971, three cosmonauts died. Space Shuttle Challenger Disaster, 1986, seven astronauts died. Pepcon Disaster, 1988, NASA rocket fuel plant explodes, killing two and costing $100 million. And the Space Shuttle Columbia Disaster, 2003, seven astronauts died. Our sixth video in this compilation focuses on the first woman to pilot a space shuttle. On February 3rd, 1995, Space Shuttle Mission STS-63 lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida for space with a woman pilot for the first time. Liquid oxygen tank now at flight pressure. Discovery crew, OTC, close and lock your visor. Initiate O2 flow. Have a good flight. That's been working. Thanks a lot. Standing by to turn off the heaters on the solid rocket booster joints. Then we'll have a final check of the booster commands. Solid rocket booster nozzles being gimbaled. T minus 18 seconds. Solid rocket boosters armed. Sound suppression water system activated. T minus 10 seconds. Go for main engine start. Main engines now started. Main engines up and running. Three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery on a mission to prepare for the next era of world cooperation in space. Hello, program Houston. Roger roll, Discovery. Houston is now controlling Discovery on its 20th trip to space. Discovery rolling on course for an orbit with the Mir space station. Mir currently half a world away above the Indian Ocean. Eileen Collins, born in Elmira, New York in 1956, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Mathematics and Economics from Syracuse University in 1979 and went on to earn a Master of Science degree in Operations Research from Stanford University in 1986 and a Master of Arts degree in Space Systems Management from Webster University in 1989. A career in the Air Force was in this remarkable lady's blood, and in 1979, she completed pilot training, one of the few women at the time to do so. Highly skilled as a pilot, she became an instructor for the next three years before flying C-141 cargo planes 
all over the world. From 1986 to 1989, Collins served as a mathematics professor at the U.S. Air Force Academy. In 1990, Eileen became just the second woman to complete test pilot training and was selected for training as an astronaut. On the 1995 Discovery mission, Collins flew as second-in-command on her historic flight as a shuttle pilot on a mission that linked up with the Russian Mir space station. Proving capable of everything she does, Collins gave birth to a daughter in 1996. She had earlier married a fellow Air Force officer. Eileen Collins was ready for more space missions by 1997 when she rocketed into space aboard the shuttle Atlantis. Up on a go for auto sequence start. T minus 31 seconds. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Atlantis's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 15. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. We have a go for main engine start. 4, 3, 2, one, we have booster ignition and liftoff of the space shuttle Atlantis, maintaining America's constant presence in space. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Uh, yes, I was just doing the program. Roger, roll Atlantis. Echoing the words of Yuri Gagarin on his launch 36 years ago, Commander Charlie Preport puts Atlantis into the roll, heads down, wings level for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Mike Fall headed to the Mir space station. Thirty seconds into the flight, Atlantis's three liquid fuel main engines now throttling back in a three-step fashion to 67% of rated performance to dampen the stress on the shuttle's aero surfaces as it breaks through the sound barrier. Then, in 1999, Collins became the first woman space shuttle commander when she took Columbia up to deploy a giant space telescope, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 15. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. We have a go for engine start, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. Booster Columbia is in the role. We've got a fuel cell pH number one. Roger roll, Columbia. We're looking at Evaluating the fuel cell. Columbia. Hey, that's complete, sir. Roger that, Columbia. Looks like we had a transient on AC1. Eileen Collins retired from the Air Force as a colonel in 2005 and a year later retired as an astronaut. Having earned the status of Master Astronaut, she has also earned numerous military awards, such as the Legion of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Force Commendation Medal, and the Legion of Honor from France, among others. Enshrined in the National Women's Hall of Fame, she has also earned the Harmon Trophy in 1995, a spot in the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, honorary degrees, and other awards ad infinitum. Working in the private sector as a member of the board of USAA, the Military Service Personnel Insurance Company, Collins spoke at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, Ohio in 2016 amid speculation that she may be named NASA Administrator. With an incredible 38 days, 8 hours, and 10 minutes in space, this remarkable woman would certainly seem well qualified to serve as the head of NASA, or for that matter just about any other job President Trump may ask of her. Eileen Collins deserves a place in the pantheon of great aviators and aviatrices as a real American hero. As a question for my students, who is your favorite female astronaut and why? If you like this video and would like to receive notification of new videos, please feel welcome to subscribe to History and Headlines. Your viewership is much appreciated.
Our seventh video in this compilation concerns the International Space Station, which was put together in part with help from space shuttle missions. On November 20th, 1998, a huge step in the history of space exploration took place when the Zarya segment of the International Space Station, or ISS, was launched. It was the first part of the largest man-made object to orbit the Earth. Still in use, the ISS can actually be seen by the naked eye from Earth. Zarya, which means sunrise in Russian, was designed by the Russians for use with their Mir space station. Called a functional cargo block, this segment of the ISS was originally used to provide electricity, storage, propulsion, and guidance during the early stages of construction of the ISS. Now it is used mostly for storage. Designed for only six to eight months of orbit on its own, Zarya was forced by delays in the ISS project to fly autonomously for two years until the next segments of the space station were launched. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. Everything is still looking good for launch of Space Shuttle Endeavour from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. T minus 50 seconds. And we are transferring to orbiter internal power at this time. Endeavour is now running off of three onboard fuel cells. Coming up for auto sequence start. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Endeavour's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 20 seconds and counting. 
T minus 15 seconds. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour with the first American element of the International Space Station uniting our efforts in space to achieve our common goal. Roll program. Houston is now controlling the Endeavour to roll on the course heading northeast from the Kennedy Space Center toward a 240 mile high rendezvous with the Zarya control module. Endeavour already traveling 575 miles per hour, altitude 3 miles, 1.5 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Three engines on board now throttled down to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass the, the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure, also uh, called max Q. Three engines on Endeavour now back at full throttle. Rear, go ahead, throttle it. Roger, go ahead, throttle it. Altitude now 11 miles. Endeavour speed 1,500 miles per hour, 8 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. One and a half minutes since liftoff, Endeavour's already burned more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant weighing less than half of what it did at launch. Altitude now 19 miles, speed 2,400 miles per hour. Flight controller standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets coming up in about 10 seconds. Drops are confirming a good separation of the twin solid rockets. Endeavour's speed now 3,200 miles per hour. It uh, moves into its second stage, three main engines. Endeavour, your performance is nominal. You are two engine maroon. Performance nominal, two engine maroon. That call indicating that uh, all performance uh, for the spacecraft right on target, all engines operating normally. Altitude now 42 miles. 61 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Zarya was paid for and owned by the United States as part of the American contribution to the ISS, but it was built in Russia and launched from Kazakhstan. Weighing in at 21 tons, Zarya is 41 feet long and 13.5 feet wide. Zarya was chosen over the U.S.-built Lockheed Bus 1 because of price, $220 million dollars compared to 450 million. Hello, I'm Sunny Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. <laughs> We're going into the Russian segment. Be ready. You don't need a passport either. It goes a lot farther back than this. Uh, we'll go take a trip and say hello to the boys down there in just a minute. But let's do that first, actually, and then we'll go down to the Soyuz at the very end. This is Yevgeny. Hi. <laughs> Doing a little tour. <laughs> this is the FGB, and what's cool about this module, it is actually the very first piece of the space station that came up in 1998. The space station has been around for about now um, man for 12 years, but it's been up in space for about 14 years. And this was the very first. It is like the Russians' PMM. It has a lot of storage, as you can see.
The ISS is the longest running manned space station ever, continuously manned since November 2, 2000, over 15 years. The previous record was held by the Soviet space station Mir at almost 10 years. The massive dimensions of the ISS are a length of 239 feet, a width of 356 feet, and a height of 66 feet. The ISS weighs just under a million pounds and is expected to be in service until at least 2024. Russian and American talks of a replacement program are taking place out of the public eye at this time. The ISS provides a platform for conducting a wide range of space-related experiments and research, as well as monitoring weather patterns on the Earth and observing outer space. The ISS, or follow-on space stations, may even serve as a way station for further forays into deep space, perhaps as a staging base for trips to the Moon or Mars. The ISS also provides a means to integrate persons from other countries into the realm of space travel as a form of cultural outreach, as well as inviting students from around the world to submit experiments that may be performed on the station. By 2015, the ISS consisted of 14 pressurized modules with the ability to discard and replace modules as needed. Several new modules have been planned with modules scheduled for 2016 and 2017, delays having prevented earlier integration of the new modules. Several other modules that were planned have been canceled for a variety of reasons, such as the retirement of the U.S. Space Shuttle program. Many other unpressurized modules containing various machinery and equipment also are attached to the ISS, both for sustaining the station and performing experiments. An orbit of the Earth takes only 92 minutes, and the ISS has done this almost 100,000 times. The complexity of life support and energy production on the ISS precludes discussion here, but besides numerous written sources for background information, Interested people can consult NASA's live webcam from the ISS or read NASA's daily ISS reports. These are just a few of the many resources available to keep track of the ISS. As a question for my students, has it been worth the approximately $100 billion to keep six people in space for the last 20 years? Please give us your thoughts on the relative value of the space program and what the goals of such a program should or should not be. As some of you, I think as you guys have been told, we're hosting astronomy night at the White House uh, with students from all over the country. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to see it through our telescope. I don't think it's that powerful. But, uh, but you, I can't tell you how inspired uh, these kids are uh, when they think about what you're doing. And, uh, you know, my suspicion is, is that uh, your Instagram, uh, Instagram feed alone has probably set a bunch of young people on a new course. Um, and they're going to be some of the kids who are coming here tonight who've never known a time where we didn't have uh, an astronaut or two living on board uh, the space station. Uh, with the uh, 15 years of continuing continuous human presence up there so congratulations to you and, and to Chell and, and everybody at NASA I, I hope more young people get to see some of the incredible things that you're doing and uh, as you know I've tasked NASA to uh, put us on a journey to Mars and uh, you're part of that process of helping us reach this goal so uh, really really proud of uh, everything everything that's going on well, thank you, sir. It's, uh, you know, it's a real privilege to be part of such a great program. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of great science up here, over 400 experiments while I'm here for this year. And, uh, you know, a lot of those are to getting us uh, on this journey to Mars. And, uh, you know, it'll be great to see it uh, be a success. And hopefully some of those kids there that will be there tonight will be, uh, be part of that in some capacity or another. If you like this video and would like to receive notification of new videos, please feel welcome to subscribe to History and Headlines. Your viewership is much appreciated.
Our eighth and final video in this compilation covers the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. On February 1st, 2003, the United States suffered the second loss of a space shuttle, this time the Columbia. 10, 9, 8, 7, we have a go for main engine start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Houston now controlling the flight of Columbia, the international research mission finally underway. Roger roll, Columbia. Columbia now rolling on to the proper azimuth for a 39 degree inclination to orbit. Shuttle in a heads down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. 30 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines beginning to throttle back in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Columbia already two and a half miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, four and a half miles in altitude, the main engines beginning to rev up to full throttle, 104% of rated performance. Your go and throttle up. We're to go and throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Rick Husband, joined on the flight deck by Pilot Willie McCool, Flight Engineer Colton Achagua, and Mission Specialist Dave Brown, Mission Specialist Laurel Clark, Payload Commander Mike Anderson, and Payload Specialist Elon Ramon seated down on the mid deck. One minute, 26 seconds into the flight. Columbia 10 miles downrange, 13 miles in altitude, traveling at 1,800 miles an hour. It's away from solid rocket booster separation, everything looking good on board Columbia. Digging deeper, we find Columbia at the completion of its 28th mission and ready to start re-entry into Earth's atmosphere at about 8.10 a.m. for an estimated 9.16 a.m. landing in Florida. Speeding around the Earth at over 20 times the speed of sound, Columbia was doomed, and the crew did not know it. Can you look at the camera for a second? Look at me. Can you see me? Yep. Yeah. Right, Casey? Oh, I 
I'll just turn towards you and I'll see what you have there. There. <laughs> okay, well. Dashback Casey, if you got any. Yeah, great. I think you can just give it to us. That's six and a half bags. Okay, I am going to have to give this to Laurel when she's done. I'm going to go to the behind, I mean, uh, a little crate behind the seat. I think this is light enough that it will stay. Oh, we see lots of jets firing. I, I, I'm getting the jets firing. I'm trying to see if I can get an overhead window view yet. Okay. That's all I can do is three and a half bags out of four, so that'll work. If I could pass that back to you. But just, uh, just one second, I want to get to my gloves before cheese build. I Certainly. Get to that. Certainly. There's all kinds of... Okay, okay. we we'll just pass the eye. Okay, I have my gloves. There's a jet flying in the back, I guess. And look, I'll take your bag. And float it aft gently. I got it. That might be, uh... Some plasma now. Think so, already? And the, the astronaut firing right now. Uh, it was quite a bit, actually. Yeah, we see it out the front also. There's some plasma. Tell me when there's good stuff out front. I'm filling overhead right now. That's uh, kind of dull. Oh, it'll be obvious when the time comes. Well, really, I guess I could give you the camera to put out the front window. Here, let's, uh, no, let's don't do that. Okay. Let's okay. just, uh, just go ahead and make sure you check your suit pressure integrity, too. All right. Check on it come with the uh, visors down. CDR. DLT. Yes, one. MS one. I don't have my gloves on yet. Yes. So oh, MS two. Uh, all right, good enough. So we're going to leave visors down now. Hello. Oh, no, I'm no, just no, saying, no. just check your seat. That's okay. Check okay, then I'm going to go back off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, good enough for me to see what check one of the things. Okay, all that's working. Noisy in there, isn't it? You see over my shoulder in a while? I, I was feeling it doesn't show up nearly as much as the back. It's going pretty good now. Oh, and it's really neat. It's a bright orange yellow out over the nose, all around the, uh, the nose. Where do you start seeing the swirl patterns at your, you know, like left or right windows? Wow. Looks like a blast horse. See here. Look at that. Yep, we're getting some cheese. Let go of the card and falls. Uh, I got a bit slipped here on the XL now. Yep. All right, we're at a uh, hundredth of a G. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yep. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. <laughs> like we did before. <laughs> I don't want to have a back one. Yeah. Oh, I really can see you on your moon. Oh, yeah? No, no, yeah, now I can. Yeah, I can see your camera. Okay. Stop playing. Okay, 
On takeoff, a piece of foam insulation had broken off of a large external fuel tank and had struck the left wing, causing damage to the outer skin. As the shuttle entered the atmosphere at about 400,000 feet of altitude, the tremendous speed compressed the atmospheric gases, creating extreme heat, a normal situation. Unfortunately, this time, the hot gases were able to penetrate the internal structure of the wing and began to destroy its structural integrity. As it passed over the West Coast, people on the ground in California, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico began seeing bright flashes coming from Columbia. By the time the doomed spacecraft was over Texas, what had been a slow disintegration suddenly became fast. As the shuttle began to break up, the passenger compartment lost pressurization and the craft went wildly out of control. The crew had little time to react and their safety harnesses failed to keep them in place. As the ship disintegrated, thousands of pieces of debris, including body parts of the crew of seven, fell over Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Government authorities advised the public not to touch any of the debris and to report their location. That did not stop enterprising people from gathering pieces and trying to sell them on eBay. The government put a quick stop to that. The post-accident investigation found that NASA officials were aware that foam had also broken off of and had struck previous shuttles, but thought that was an acceptable risk. They had also been aware of the foam hitting the wing this time, but apparently thought there was nothing they could do about it and did not notify the crew or take any actions to mount a rescue flight. It was initially reported that no rescue flight was possible, but investigators found that there was indeed a chance one could have been mounted in time to rescue the crew or fix the damage. The investigators were critical of the NASA bureaucracy's decision-making, which resulted in some reorganization at NASA. As with the Challenger disaster, the Columbia tragedy resulted in a two-year hiatus of shuttle flights. Future flights had much of the dangerous foam removed from the fuel tanks, and further crew survivability measures were implemented. No further shuttle disasters occurred, and the remaining shuttle fleet was retired in 2011. A bizarre aspect of this disaster is that worms in a petri dish taken into space as part of an experiment were found to have survived the crash. As a question for my students, do you remember seeing the Columbia disaster on television when it occurred in 2003? Or did that tragic event occur before you were born? If you like this video and would like to receive notification of new videos, please feel welcome to subscribe to History and Headlines. Your viewership is much appreciated. As a question for my students and subscribers, having watched this compilation, what do you think was the greatest accomplishment of the Space Shuttle program? Also, which of the eight videos used to make this compilation do you consider to be your favorite? Please let us know in the comments section below this video.